I haven't recorded on this in a minute and I forgot how bad this camera is. So <laughs> sorry about that. I'm using some good ones lately. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you guys and get started on chapter 22 here. So chapter 22, um, dealing with the digestive system, essentially the gastrointestinal system and the diseases associated with that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just more of the same, right? Different, different system, different day, different system, different day for this slide as well. I'm sure you guys are come aware to the fact that these are all just the same thing, but just different systems. So um, <clears throat> the eight main parts of the GI system, mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, rectum, and the anus. And then there are four accessory organs, um, the salivary glands, liver, gallbladder, and pancreas that are associated with the function of the other organs. So that makes sense. Um, a lot of these diseases are gonna affect that aspect, a lot of them in the colon. So what defenses does the GI tract have against you know, infection and pathogens? They have a thick layer of mucus involved. They have secretory IgA, which is important for any of the mucosa. Uh, peristalsis that keeps uh, microbes moving, push them out before they can you know, adhere and take hold. Saliva has lysozyme in it, which breaks down the peptidoglycan and um, lactoferrin. So that'll help, um, you know, use up any of the iron in the area. So microbes can't have it. So um, <clears throat> the stomach has a low pH, the, and then bile is antimicrobial and it has a slightly high pH. Um, so that helps um, prevent growth as well as it being a surfactant. And that'll help um, cause damage to any of the cell membranes. So the GALT is the, um, probably I feel like the most important aspect of this is the gut associated um, lymphoid tissue. So the normal, I'm not sharing this screen. Let's share a different screen. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, let's get sharing this one. Let's. Let's do a different screen. Hi, hi, we're gonna, there we go. That's the one we want. Okay, sorry about that. Perfect, okay. So um, you wanna see my weird click on screen doesn't really help you guys at all. So the Human Microbiome Project tells us that, yeah, we got it. Um, you know, what kinds of organisms might be living in the gut? And I mean, come on guys. It's a lot. <laughs> so the main organs that are involved, the ones that we were just talking about, those eight main portions of the GI tract, they're going to have lots of different kinds of microbes. I mean, lots, lots, like 10 to the 11th, lots. Okay. And then um, the accessory organs, like the gallbladder and the pancreas and the salivary glands. What was the other one? Just the liver. Is that what we're saying? Is it an accessory organ? Jeez. Yeah. Okay. And pancreas. Yeah. So those should be free of any resident microorganisms. There shouldn't be anything growing in those. So functions of the normal gut biota, they have a protective function. We've talked about this. We've talked so many times about how much the gut biome um, or any biome in any part of your body is going to help protect you, like taking up the seats in the stadium. That's my favorite analogy because it works, right? So the um, normal biome won't let the bad guys take a seat. And then also normal biome can make their own toxins that bite off the bad guys. So that's kind of nice as well. Um, so protective function of the normal biota. They also digest and provide nutrients for us that we can't digest and break down on our own. And they teach our immune system to react properly to antigens. Um, having a diverse gut biome is associated with health in general. And we had mentioned a while back about how you know mental health can even be linked with your gut biome, which I think is just fascinating. All right, the most common infectious disease in people is also a boring one. It's dental caries. Sorry for you guys who are dent <laughs> you know dental assistant majors. I apologize. Not I mean not really, but you know, um, this is not that exciting of a disease. Many of us have had to deal with it probably personally, especially the older that you get, like me. You probably had at least one cavity, right? So that's what this is. That's what we're talking about here. Um, this is dissolution of the tooth surface, breakdown of the tooth surface um, due to the metabolic action of bacteria. As the bacteria break things down, they themselves um, might produce acid, 
like we have seen in the lab ourselves, right? So um, that's what's going to be affecting our enamel negatively. The ones that are associated with disrupting the enamel and causing dental caries, um, infection of the of the tooth and tooth decay, um, will be Streptococcus mutans and Streptococcus sobriness. So those are the main ones. Um, incidence of dental caries uh, varies according to how many how sugary your diet is. That's a, tr a real thing. Um, oral hygiene, how much you are brushing your teeth or flossing. Flossing is very important to break up the um, like the biofilm that forms on your teeth. There's always a biofilm going to form on your teeth, believe me. So keep up with flossing. Um, if you're not going to floss every day, just at least try to get it in three times a week, guys. Um, it'll help dramatically. And if you are going to come to me and be like, yes, but Professor Yost, like when I floss, my gums bleed. And I'm like, yeah, keep doing it. And probably within two weeks, your gums are going to be healthy. So just keep up with it. Um, so incidence varies. Um, yeah, right. So oral hygiene and then genetic factors, of course, as well, right? So some people are just more susceptible naturally to these things because of maybe how their pH differences of their own mouth or how much lysozyme is present in their saliva. Just all sorts of stuff can affect that. I just think it's amazing how much your, you know, dental hygiene can affect like your health as well, um, your overall health. So I mean, if you're interested in that, then you should probably go into dental hygiene. But um, yeah, it is interesting. So, and I am one of those people that brushes twice a day and flosses and uses mouthwash. Um, I don't, I don't brush after every meal, but I definitely get two brushes in a day. So I, I don't know. I don't consider myself anal about this, but I definitely am a proponent of brushing your teeth regularly. So um, prevents cavities. I've never had, I've had one cavity that was a very shallow cavity. That's it. So, um, but yeah, brush them, floss them, keep it healthy. Um, right. Moving on. Right. God. First we have the pellicle. So it's a little divot a little divot down into the enamel. Oh, geez. Not, not, not as scary as I made it sound, but I wasn't expecting it. Um, I'll just go ahead. I guess if I have to select the freaking pen, I thought it would just do it automatically. The little divot down in your teeth is called a pellicle. And, um, you know, you get colonized in those little divots or, or, um, uh, malformations in the teeth, not really malformations, but, you know, um, things that have gotten ground down or um, all that stuff makes the surface for the bacteria to be able to hold on to a little bit better. So that's what's going on there with that pellicle formation. So the bacteria come and stick on and they form a biofilm, right? And that's what plaque is. Plaque is a bacterial biofilm on your teeth. They grow, they make acid as a byproduct, like we've seen left and right in the lab, right? With those yellow tubes. Yeah. Those yellow tubes with the little uh, gas collectors in them, what to, What are those called again? Durham tubes, right? I know you guys answered with me. That was great. I appreciate it. So um, anyways, that's what eats into your actual tooth after that. Okay. It just is like compounding upon itself there. Periodontitis. Okay. Gingivitis is referring to swelling, loss of normal color, patches, redness, and increased bleeding of the gums, the gingiva. Spaces or pockets developed between the tooth and the gingiva, the gum tissue. Disease will extend into the periodontal membrane and the cementum, and deeper involvement will um, increase the size of those pockets and cause bone resorption. Literally, as the infection is spreading, you're having receding of the gum line and further infection deeper down within the teeth and then within the actual um, structures that are holding the teeth into the bone and then the bone itself can get um, dissolved away by the effects of the growing bacteria. So it's not uncommon. So here we have a depiction of that, a normal, uh, number one, normal teeth. Number two, we're having calculus, not the math. We're talking about you know, calcification here, not math. That is horrible math, please. Never that. So, um, the calcium buildup and um, early gingivitis forming here where we're getting these pockets and then um, the bacteria are going to start, you know, doing their thing, making the acids and causing more tissue damage around them. And then we have bone resorption where the bone has actually started to recede itself from around the tooth and down. You can lose teeth that way. 
this is just um, an x-ray that is showing that exactly that has happened. Um, when we look here at the, the root that's on the tooth and that's where the bone should be, you know, so it shouldn't be like how it is here, so. Right, necrotizing, ulcerative, gingivitis, and periodontitis. Um, gross is pretty much what this is, okay? So it's trench mouth. Oh, that just doesn't even sound good because it originally originated um, and was recognized in um, World War I with, with soldiers who were like stuck in the trenches and couldn't like brush their teeth or take care of their teeth at all. And this developed due to that poor dental hygiene. Um, it was a synergistic infection, meaning there are several bacteria that come together and, you know, make this happen. That's Treponema um, vincenti, Prevotella intermedia, and Fusobacterium species. So this will lead to severe pain, bleeding, um, pseudomembrane formation, and necrosis, which is essentially rotting away of the flesh. Let's talk about the mumps. We know of the mumps pretty much whenever we talk about the measles, mumps, rubella, vaccine, the MMR vaccine. Um, that's what most of us would think of. And then really not much other than that, because we don't see it a lot in the United States because we're pretty well vaccinated for this, right? Signs and symptoms would include fever, nasal discharge, muscle pain, and malaise. I feel like that all the time. Then you have inflammation of the salivary glands and you get like these gopher like swollen cheeks, which you can clearly see in whoever this guy is here. You got that swelling going on. Um, and then uh, the mumps can invade other organs. Um, it's caused by a virus, by the way. It can move into other organs, um, testes, ovaries, pancreas, meninges, heart, and the kidney. 20 to 30% of young adult males who will be infected by the mumps virus. Um, the virus will localize in the epididymis and the testes, but it won't cause sterility, but it'll just hang out there. So we prevent infection with this uh, by, you know, giving the MMR vaccine, get vaccinated folks. So next we have gastritis and gastric ulcers, super exciting stuff so far, I know. Um, gastritis is just sharp or burning pain in the abdomen. Um, often this is caused by gastric or peptic ulcers, which are lesions in the up stomach or uppermost portion of the small intestine. A lot of times, most of the time, this is caused by infection with this bacteria. Helicobacter pylori it infects about half of the world, um, and it's treated with tetracycline and metronidazole. Um, yeah, and it infects naturally about half the people in the world. Um, and then whenever the balance gets thrown off by the pH of your stomach acid or um, poor diet or, um, you know, not taking care of, of yourself, you know, all that sort of stuff can lead to um, an imbalance of the growth of that bacterium. And that's what would lead to development of the ulcers as a result. Whoa. Um, so we can use scopes like endoscopes to go look down into the stomach. We can also use colonoscopy to look up the other way. Um, so, you know, we can look all the way down and, and check out to see if there's any ulcers in the stomach or, or the uh, upper part of the small intestine that way. Another way we can test for this is with this breath test. And I took it one time because I was having stomach pain from my um, whey allergy, whey protein allergy. I didn't know that was what it was, but I found out later. Um, but yeah, I got tested for this. And basically it, you breathe into a bag and then they give you a drink and you wait like 15 minutes and then you breathe into a bag again and then they mail it off. <laughs> they mail it off and then they tell you if you have this bacteria or not. And yes, it has to do with, you know, byproducts of um, they'll put, you know, urea in the drink that you, you did and it's a radioactive relatively safe radioactive urea. And as I'm sure you guys remember from lab, urease, if it is present, um, which it is in the case of H. pylori bacteria, um, it'll break down urea and one of the products um, will be carbon dioxide as well as uh, you know ammonia, which is why we have the pH change for alkaline for our test, right? Definitely remember it. Um, Anyways, uh, the CO2 that enters the blood as a result of this carbon dioxide um, is now marked with that radioactive um, urea marker and you exhale it and that's how they come they know. So it's neat. Um, let's talk about diarrhea because that's interesting. So now we have diarrhea with or without 
vomiting, just, just normal acute diarrhea. All right, diarrhea is defined as three or more loose stools in a 24 hour period. The US um, averages about 1.2 to 1.9 cases per person per year, okay, right? Um, about a third of those are transmitted by contaminated food of some kind. Um, in tropical countries, 10 per year for children. Um, more than 3 million children will die from diarrhea per year. Most of those are going to be in the developing countries, the less well-off countries. So here are our causes. If we're talking about just having the illness of diarrhea, the most common cause is going to be Campylobacter. And it's, a back, it's a bacteria. Um, however, if we're talking about the deadliness of certain, uh, you know, diarrhea related diseases, then we're really talking the most about like salmonella and toxoplasma here. So salmonella is really one to be aware of. So what is salmonella? Salmonella, it produces, it's a bacterium, by the way, <laughs> it doesn't say that, but it is, it is, it's gram negative bacteria. Um, uh, it has H, O, and K antigens, okay? Uh, the H is the flagella, the K is the capsule, and the O is the wall associated with this organism. So um, they can ferment glucose. They have acid and gas pr production. With that, they do produce H2S, so the black precipitate, uh, but not urease. So they're not gonna be able to break down urea. The salmonella can't. Um, and they'll grow readily in lab media and everything like that. They're pretty hardy. They can survive a lot of inhospitable environments. Symptoms and signs. I don't need you to know any of this part here. Uh, enteric fever or gastroenteritis can range from mild diarrhea to fever and septicemia. Um, then we have typhoid fever. It's related to toxin production based on whether or not there's a lot of different serotypes of um, salmonella, a lot. And um, some of them do produce the typhoid toxin um, and others don't. And so if they do, then that would lead to development of typhoid fever. So salmonella typhi does that, for example. Um, typhoid fever, I mean, we do have that toxin. We have progressive invasive infection, um, including septicemia, which is going to be growth of the bacteria in your bloodstream, right? Um, you'll become septic and fever, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. Um, it has a relatively high, uh, ID 50. So the amount of organisms that you need in order to infect kind of pretty high and it's super high, but, um, it is high, but unfortunately these guys can survive quite well on a lot of surfaces and stuff. So you tend to get, get that going on a little easily. So, okay. Uh, typhoid Mary. I, I mentioned this in the uh, lecture class a lot. I don't know if I mentioned it in the videos yet, but typhoid Mary, man, she uh, was a cook in Ireland in the 1900s. She was an asymptomatic carrier of uh, typhoid fever. So salmonella um, with the typhoid toxin, right? Um, she had it in her um, gallbladder. So it wasn't producing any symptoms for her in her gut where that would normally happen. She, because of this, infected 51 people, three of whom died. So we, they found out, the doctors and staff found out that she was, you know, sick with typhoid fever. So they quarantined her from 1907 to 1910 for three years. And they released her out of quarantine from the hospital on the condition that she was never to cook again for somebody else. And she um, had to be very hygienic. She had to use proper hygiene. So she went and changed her name and went back to cooking because that's what you do whenever you transmit deadly diseases. <laughs> um, so that, you know, people got sick again and died again. And so they had to quarantine her again until literally from 1915 until she died. So, <laughs> um, man, it's just, I can't imagine this. So they didn't have the antibiotics to treat this back then, um, but they did know that, you know, they understood about infectious agents and everything. So, yeah. Next, we'll talk about Shigella. It's gram negative, straight rod, non-motile, non-endospore forming. Um, Shigella dysenteriae is the most severe form. I mean, I'm sure you can guess what it causes. And then Shigella sauni and Shigella flex flexerni. I can never say it, but um, we have, you know, many cases of those. It's a different form of it, but the dysenteriae is the one that's the worst. So with Shigellosis, we have frequent watery stools and intense abdominal pain. 
nausea and vomiting are common and often not just diarrhea associated here. This is dysentery. So dysentery is diarrhea with blood in it. As far as the pathogenesis and the virulence factors of Shigella bacteria, um, Shigella invade the, the villus cells of the large intestine. It doesn't go deep into through the tissue of the large intestine or invade the blood and nothing like that, just mostly in the villi, okay? Um, they release endotoxin. That leads to fever, right? Endotoxin is a pyrogen. And then they have an enterotoxin, entero, enteric, meaning the gut, okay? So a toxin that's associated with them, you know, growing in the gut. Um, it damages those, uh, the mucosa surrounding it and um, the villi that they're kind of living in, hiding out in, right? Um, so then we have bleeding and secretion of mucus as a result of the effect of that enterotoxin. Um, so then uh, we have the shiga toxin that is responsible for more serious damage to the intestine as well as systemic effects. So enterotoxin, shiga toxin, bad, they cause leading to dysentery and, you know, awfulness and terribleness. Um, here we have a depiction of the effects that shigella can have in the digestive tract and the GI tract. You can clearly see this. I don't think you need me to describe it to you. But um, you'll have loss of the villi in the digestive tract, as well as um, clear inflammation and, and bleeding and damage of the cells in the area. So we also have some E. coli, e. coli out there that produce the same toxin, that shiga toxin. Um, the one that you have probably heard the absolute most of is that one. It's STEC. So that is E. coli 0157H7. It's one of the most concerning ones whenever we're looking into um, e. coli contamination of food products, okay? Um, mild gastritis, gastroenteritis, um, to fever, and then um, sometimes bloody diarrhea. So that's what we're talking about with dysentery, okay? Um, it can lead to hemolytic uremic syndrome where we have hemolysis, which is like busting, breaking open of your red blood cells. Um, and that leads to anemia because you're breaking up so many of your red blood cells, right? And then because your kidneys are having to filter through all of that damage that's being done to red blood cells and the effects of the hemolysis in your bloodstream, it can cause kidney damage and eventually failure. So STEC is, is no small fry, you know. Um, I don't know. Sorry, I got a message from a student. So you get it. Um, so same toxin as Shigella. This is the Shiga toxin. <clears throat> yeah, uh, undercooked beef primarily and other contaminated foods and beverages. There's a bunch of other diseases that E. coli can cause that are associated with the gastro, um, gastroenteritis, you know, diseases. So here we have enterotoxigenic E. coli, traveler's diarrhea, diarrhea, low-grade fever, nausea, and vomiting, typical. Um, enteroinvasive E. coli. So here we have um, bas bacillary dysentery. I mean, they are bacilli, right? They're rod-shaped bacteria. The dysentery, blood, mucus, and the stool. This is really this version of it in developing countries. The next one, um, enteropathogenic E. coli. We have watery diarrhea, fever, vomiting, um, effacement of the gut surfaces. So losing these, the like structure and prominence of the uh, surfaces inside of the gut, like the villi and the folds and stuff like that. Um, Enteroaggregative, that's too many Gs. E. coli, um, the that one, the EA, <laughs> EA, E. coli, um, that's diarrhea in young patients and AIDS patients it can lead to chronic version of diarrhea. We'll talk about it soon. And um, diffusely adherent E. coli, Adherent is um, the ones that will be involved in the UTIs um, and moving into places where they shouldn't be going, right? You're not supposed to have that in your urinary tract, but they're the ones with um, ability to um, cause that sort of stuff, sticking in your bladder and everything. All right, next, Campylobacter. That's the one that I've already told you about, right? Foodborne illness, the most common cause of uh, diarrhea, uh, you know, infectious diarrhea, um, especially foodborne. Okay. So leads to frequent watery stools, fever, vomiting, headaches, severe abdominal pain, and symptoms can last, you know, even longer than two weeks and they can recur as well. Um, this uh, bacteria is a gram negative bacteria. It's a curved or spiral shape to it, and it has polar flagella. So at each end, 
Um, they are micro aerophilic inhabitants of the intestinal tracts of animals and humans. Do you guys remember what micro aerophilic means? It means they only need very little oxygen in order to survive, very little, something that we would not be able to handle. So here is the microbiology of a turkey, guys. So um, where are we getting our microbiology, our, our microbes from on our turkeys? Well, we're getting it from the handler of the meat uh, or the people who are preparing it, right? Um, the animal that it was harvested from and then um, just leaving it in storage for a long time, letting the bacteria grow. So um, Staphylococcus aureus, um, found in about 96% uh, of uh, cases, 52% of those are going to be resistant to antibiotics. So, salmonella enterica, about 18% of bacteria on the turkey. It's going to be that. That's salmonella. That's what we were just talking about. Um, Campylobacter, what we were just immediately talking about. Um, about 8% of turkeys will harbor that. And remember, that's going to be about 50% of food poisoning over Thanksgiving. And this is, was, sorry, I, the slides are made in Thanksgiving period, but like you can have a turkey for Easter or something. I don't think you are. So this, think of this, think ahead of time. Um, Clostridium perfringens. Hey, that causes um, GI symptoms as well. But if you remember, we have introduced this before um, whenever we were talking about gas gangrene. You definitely don't want that. So, <laughs> um, and then E. coli, of course. So advice to keep things safe. Don't thaw it on the counter, thaw it in the fridge or in cold water, okay? Uh, wash your hands before handling and after handling as well. Um, prepare your turkey on separate surface away from the cooked foods and vegetables and stuff like that. Don't mix that stuff up. Um, stuffing, if you're gonna pack your turkey with stuffing, which I don't do, but um, you'll have it loosely packed and it should be heated to 165 degrees Fahrenheit when you stick a thermometer in it before, um, before even being stuffed, okay? Uh, cook your turkey to an internal temperature at the breast, the deepest part of the breast, 185 degrees Fahrenheit. The juices should run perfectly clear if you cut into it deep. Um, refrigerate your leftovers within two hours of taking it out of the oven um, and, and beginning to serve it, you know, um, and you want to eat those leftovers within two to three days. Okay. Uh, after that, you're risking getting sick. All right. C. diff, Clostridium difficile or difficile, however you like saying it. Um, these are gram-positive and they're endospore-forming rods um, found in the normal biota of some people's intestines. They lead to pseudomembranous colitis, um, antibiotic-associated colitis, okay? They uh, treat you with broad-spectrum antibiotics. It kills off your normal flora, but these hardy endospore guys are gonna overgrow now that everybody's left the stadium, right? We've heard of that before. So they have enterotoxins A and B, which lead to necrosis in the wall of the intestine. Um, so, you know, essentially rotting of the intestine, um, death of the tissue in the intestine. So you will treat this. You'll stop giving people the antibiotics. Just stop it. Okay. No, we'll treat with just metronidazole, which is a little bit different and brought in a different way. Um, and then you can think about um, administering fecal transplants if needed, which we've mentioned previously, trying to put a new flora into somebody's body. Um, again, you will be um, under, you know, sedation and it'll be colonoscopy. It won't be like feeding it to you. Um, so here we can see some pictures of uh, development of the disease of C. diff and the um, just the bad pathogenesis that we see inside of the colon as you progress through the disease. So Okay, cholera. Cholera is an interesting one, right? Um, I think it is. So cholera is uh, caused by Vibrio cholerae. That is the bacteria that causes it. It's comma-shaped. Um, it has single uh, polar flagellum. So that shape that it is, that little comma shape is called Vibrio itself, okay? Um, this is transmitted by contaminated water. Um, it, and they, it produces the cholera toxin, which is what is going to lead to a lot of these symptoms, okay? That's the important thing about that one. Cholera toxin, cholera symptoms. Severe dehydration can result due to rice watery stool. And yes, I mean rice watery. It's like a whiter color. It will still have some brown aspect to it and sometimes a little bit of, um, you know, red as well. But basically that rice water, like if you were to cook water, 
um, cook rice in water and take the water that resulted. That is what these people's stool starts to look like. So severe dehydration. Um, it can lead to a 55 to 70% mortality rate um, when there's an outbreak. Um, serious disease, right? Do That's due to the dehydration. So um, we need oral rehydration therapy um, in order to treat that. Hopefully you can get... Um, Hopefully that works, but if it doesn't, then you're going to have to get IV, um, you know, treatment as well. So there's that. So, right. The A and B toxin that cholera makes causes the cells to pump out all of the electrolytes, loss of water, sodium, potassium, chlorine ions. And then we have, um, bicarb, bicarb, sodium, uh, that's bicarbonate essentially is going to be maintaining the pH of your blood. So if you're pumping all of these things out, and we know that some of these stuff has to do with your nerve function, some of this stuff has to do with just keeping your body's pH stable, all of this is getting pumped out of the cells when it shouldn't. Um, it also has a pilus. Um, I don't know what that means by syringe, but I know that what this is hinting at is a passage of, you know, transfer, um, horizontal transfer of genes through the sex pilus, right? So they can connect um, to one another and transmit their, I don't know, BS. So we've had, it's endemic in um, some of these less um, affluent nations or, or less, de less developed nations, um, uh, Mexico, India, Asia, Africa, South and Central America. And when I say um, less developed, what I'm talking about here is um, it, this is going to happen in the poorer parts of these countries, not really in the areas of these countries that people are living like well. Okay. Um, there's an outbreak in Cameroon in 2011 that was quite severe. All right. John Snow. We're going to talk about John Snow now. Not this John Snow, but this John Snow. Not exactly, you know, as much of eye candy, but important guy. Okay. John Snow. Um, there was an 1854, there was a cholera epidemic in London. And so he, this guy took it upon himself to map out the cases. And um, he noticed a pattern that there was a clustering of cases around specific wells within London. Because at that point, you know, people still getting water from wells and stuff like that. Um, so he was able to narrow it down to a specific well, which you can see here is this. You can see the cases are definitely centering around that. And so they were able to um, deal with the outbreak and, and keep it from spreading by, um, you know, not letting people use that well and eventually hopefully treating that well. Um, so it's no longer going to be passing that bacteria back and forth, right? Um, so that's the first ideas of um, major epidemiology that were applied. So it's interesting stuff. I think it's pretty neat. This is where we have issues with cholera today in the red. These are the ones that have actual cholera cases, um, just endemic really within their own countries. And then the gold is areas where they have had people have cholera, but they've been brought in, imported in from those other countries that are in red. In Haiti in 2010, um, in October, there was, you know, uh, I guess the earthquake was in January, but and uh, there's an outbreak of cholera in October, okay? Um, people had been living in shanty towns. Their homes or actual houses were knocked down by the earthquake um, and destroyed. The people that were going out there to help them out were also living in close quarters like this. Um, and uh, there's very close contact. Things were not being kept clean because there's just, you know, water wasn't as readily available. Um, so it just wasn't as clean as we, they would have liked for it to be. And there was, uh, you know, I, as what, from what I understand, stool um, not being disposed of properly and all that. So cholera was not endemic in Haiti. Um, it was brought from outside during all of this. So 5% of people involved developed severe dehydrating acute watery diarrhea. In this case, we had less than 1% fatality rate, which is at least, you know, not as severe as it could have been. And there were 13 cases in Florida. These were physicians that had gone to go help. So it's still an issue today. We think of cholera as being an old disease, but it really isn't. Um, there is a vaccine available for it. It is used, um, it is for made from killed bacteria, okay? Uh, it gives protection for about two years, not a super long time, but it's something if you live in an area that has cholera endemic, right? Um two doses, one to six weeks apart in order to, for protection to work. 
Next, we'll talk about cryptosporidium. This is an apicomplexin complexin protozoan. Um, if you remember correctly about your AP complexins, I'm sure you do. We have talked previously about malaria being an AP complexin. So it's that type of a uh, protozoa, okay? Not really necessarily directly related, but they have the same life cycles and stuff like that, okay? They don't, um, they're typically non-modal and all of that. They uh, have hardy intestinal oocysts as well as um, a tissue phase where they actually live within the tissue, right? Um, they penetrate intestinal cell walls. They live um, intracellularly um, inside of the actual cells. Um, the oocysts are highly infectious and they are resistant to chlorine treatment. Then we have symptoms um, including headache, sweating, vomiting, severe abdominal cramps, and diarrhea. Okay, so this, the thing that you I know about this and that you guys are gonna now know and you're not gonna wanna forget, this is associated with swimming pools, especially if the swimming pools are getting warmer and they're not very well chlorinated. Okay, so public pools, this is bad. Next, we have rotavirus. So a double-stranded RNA genome and inner and an outer capsid. Um, primary cause of morbidity and mortality resulting from diarrhea. Um, so can be quite severe, right? So it can be... Uh, you would not notice it is what I'm trying to say. So you can just sit through it, this one, right? It's transmitted fecal oral route, just like a lot of these other diarrheal diseases um, can be transmitted by fomite as well. And I don't know, it has treatments, it has vaccines available um, and you still see quite a few cases of it, but yeah, I don't know, it's diarrhea, it's viral diarrhea. Next is another viral diarrhea is norovirus. Um, it's the most common viral cause of foodborne illness in the US fecal oral transmission or contaminated food or water. They have people who are infected have profuse watery diarrhea for three to five days and they'll have vomiting in the early stages. It has a low infectious dose. It only takes one to 20 viruses to infect somebody. And many outbreaks um, of this virus is associated with travel on a cruise ship. Um, this is that cruise ship diarrhea virus that everybody hears about all the time. There's just that massive outbreak just recently. And I'm sure those of you who are watching this now you know what I'm talking about, but um, yeah, a lot of people got sick. This is norovirus. All right. Um, now we're going to talk about diarrhea, potentially with vomiting caused by exotoxins. Okay. These are bacteria will produce these exotoxins, but the exotoxins themselves are the ones that are causing the disease, not the bacteria. Okay. Like how we talk about with tetanus or botulism, similar thing. Okay. Um, nausea and vomiting, you'll have diarrhea. Um, if you share a meal with somebody and um, they, they will get sick as well, a faster um, turnaround time as far as when symptoms will show up. This is intoxication rather than infection. Um, yeah. So common causes, um, we're gonna have staphylococcus, right? Staphylococcus has an enterotoxin, um, is heat stable and induces symptoms of cramping, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. When you eat a thing with that enterotoxin in it, the staphylococcus enterotoxin, um, you will have these symptoms starting within one to six hours of eating the meal, and but you'll typically recover within 24 hours because the bacteria isn't usually flourishing in you. It's just the uh, effects of the toxin that are lingering, okay? Then we have Bacillus cereus. These guys do have endospores, so they are pretty hardy. They um, they also make a toxin, so that's the whole point of all this that we're discussing, but um, the toxin is what would lead to these different forms. So they have an emetic form and a, a diarrheal form. The emetic, that means vomiting, okay? Um, that's more frequently tied to fried rice that was cooked and kept warm like under a lamp for a long period of time. Um, the diarrheal form is associated with cooked meats and vegetables hold at warm temperatures for a long time. Then we have Clostridium perfringens. Again, we are seeing this guy. Um, that's the one previously we've talked about with gas gangrene. Um, these guys also have endospores and will contaminate meat, fish, vegetables, and beans that have not been cooked properly. Right. Chronic diarrhea. This is diarrhea that lasts longer than 14 days. Um, that's bad. 
you have an infectious or non-infectious cause, uh, non-infectious would include like IBS or ulcerative colitis. AIDS patients can often suffer just chronically from diarrhea as well. Um, yeah, microbes in this section that we're going to talk about are ones that can cause diarrhea in otherwise relatively healthy people. So uh, I'm with this, I can't with this word, enteroaggregative E. coli, the EA, E. coli. This one, especially with the chronic um, diarrhea, I warned you that this was coming. So um, these guys adhere to the human cells and they and they do so in aggregates, so in clumps, essentially, um, rather than single cells. And that uh, will lead to stimulation of large amounts of mucus in the gut as a result of those clumping of the cells together. They are transmitted through food and through water. Um, so it's associated with chronic disease, particularly in children and those who are malnourished, okay? Um, cyclospora. All right, cyclospora. Cayetanensis. Uh-uh. Okay, so that cyclospora. Um, this is an emerging pathogen. That means it's new to the United States. Um, something that we're seeing just now. Um, fecal oral transmission, consumption of fresh produce and water contaminated with feces. Their oocysts are um, not observable in the feces, but they can be visuals visualized. Um, their presence, whether they're there or not, using UV light. Um, symptoms include watery diarrhea, stomach cramps, bloating, fever, and muscle aches. Then when, this is the pictures of them um, in a stain, so you can see the difference um, there. Next is Giardia. Um, Giardia is a pathogenic flagellated protozoan. Diarrhea of long duration, again, chronic diarrhea. Abdominal pain, flatulence, and then greasy, mallow, odorous stools. That sounds awful. So um, it has a complex epidemiological pattern. It is has been isolated from beavers, cattle, coyotes, cats, and even human carriers that are natural carriers of it. Um, the cysts of Giardia can survive up to two months just hanging out in the environment. And epidemics are often traced to water from mountain streams as well as chlorinated municipal water. So it can be kind of hardy. So this is a look at the cyst at the top versus what looks like the horseshoe crab, if you ask me, but that is the um, trophozoite form of Giardia. Look like they have little eyes on top. You guys remember that from the eukaryote slides. Next is entamoeba. This is um, intestinal and extra intestinal forms. And targets the cecum, the appendix, the colon, the rectum. Um, so we've got a lot of stuff going down in the lower portion of the GI tract. Penetrates deeper layers of mucosa, leads to dysentery, um, bloody mucus filled stools, abdominal pain, including diarrhea, um, fever, and weight loss, and can lead to hemorrhage, perforation, appendicitis, and amoebomas, which is going to be swelling um, and growth of kind of, I don't want to say tumor areas, but essentially tumor areas um, where the amoeba has taken hold. And we've got swelling and overgrowth um, of, of skin where it's trying to heal and all that. So um, humans are primary hosts, um, and then infection will come from food and contaminated water from the cysts. Next is parvo. So this is canine parvovirus. It will lead to vomiting and dysentery. Uh, it leads to the destruction of intestinal crypts. So all those little folds that we have going on in the intestine, dehydration and septicemia. Uh, this is highly contagious between dogs through their feces and it's very severe in puppies. That can lead to respiratory failure um, as well as cardiac fail, uh, cardiovascular overall failure. Um, mortality is 91% in pups if they are not treated. Um, they can, if you need to get rid of parvo, like if you're at like the Humane Society or something and somebody brought in a dog that had this, you'd wanna treat the entire area with bleach and a formalin bomb in order to kill off any of the virus that could be hanging around so it doesn't get transmitted. Um, there is a vaccine for this. So vaccinate your, your puppy. Um, this is the Parvo vaccine. Next is hepatitis. This is an inflammatory disease of the liver. Um, necrosis or, you know, death essentially of the hepatocytes and breakdown of the hepatocytes. Um, so that's the liver cells. Uh, we have response by mononuclear white blood cells. Um, they'll um, swell, disrupt the liver architecture, causing inflammation and stuff in the liver. 
uh, this interferes with excretion of bile pigments, causes bilirubin to build up that yellowish color um, that'll cause jaundice. Hep A, this is non-enveloped single strand RNA. Um, signs and symptoms with this hepatitis association, uh, jaundice you'll only see about 10% of cases. Subclinical symptoms can exist, um, you know, not, not really having any symptom at all or very, very minor symptoms they might not notice otherwise, like flu-like symptoms. Um, transmission and epidemiology of hep A, this is fecal oral transmission. Um, it's pretty transmissible between people. Um, immunizations are available for hep A. In hep B, we have an enveloped DNA virus. Signs and symptoms include fever, chills, malaise, anorexia, abdominal discomfort, diarrhea, and nausea. Rashes and arthritis may occur. This causes hepatocellular carcinoma because we have this damage going on to the cells and they're trying to heal. And the, due to the actual presence of the virus itself taking over the cell machinery, that can lead to development of um, carcinoma over time. So that's cancer. So that's transmitted by very minute amounts of blood. It does not take very much. And it can also be uh, sexually transmitted. It's, there is an effective vaccine available paired, paired typically with the uh, A if you're getting your series done. Um, but yeah, if you're a healthcare worker, you definitely want to get that vaccine. So hep C, about 4.1 million are, Americans are infected with hep C. Signs and symptoms are similar to B. Um, 75 to 85% uh, people will remain infected indefinitely. So like basically forever, you will not recover from it. Transmission and epidemiology includes blood transfusions um, from somebody who had hep C or sharing needles for drugs, which I feel like is the more common way of getting this. Treatment includes, um, there's no vaccine for this one. Uh, they have pegylated interferon, ribo ribavirin, um, protease, polymerase, they have a whole bunch of drugs. Basically, they try to throw at you all at once is what I'm trying to say. And there is a uh, treatment now with uh, antivirals for hepatitis C that have shown success in actually curing and eliminating viral infection with hep C. Very interesting. All right, the helminths, let's do this. I know this is what you guys were waiting for your whole lives. You've wanted to hear me talk about worms. So here we go. The, hel the helminths, guys. I know I sound really excited. Sorry, I have people <laughs> messaging me. Um, there's amazing diversity among helminths that um, parasitize humans. We don't really see these as much. They're neglected tropical diseases in you know third world countries or underdeveloped countries. Um, eosino eosinophilia, so your eosinophils, you'll have way too many of them if you have a helminthic infection, okay? You've got worms in you. You've also got eosinophils in you, all right? Uh, so even though these are pre prevalent and kind of can be severe and awful diseases, they're very underfunded because they are in these third world countries, which is sad. Um, path pathogenesis and virulence factors of these in general. Um, they have specialized parts for attachment to the host tissue, enzymes to penetrate tissues, the cuticle on their outside that sort of works um, to protect them just from an anything from outside of them. And then we have uh, the, their definitive host, each one has a definitive host. That's the host where the adult worm will reproduce sexually. Now I have to remind you guys about this. Worms aren't as simple as like bacteria and viruses. Worms are gonna have several stages in their life cycle. So we're not just talking about, there'll be eggs, there'll be larvae, sometimes multiple stages of larvae and then adult worms. Um, and then it depends on how they're gonna transmit themselves after that through eggs or whatever. So keep that in mind. There's a lot going on with these worms. How do we diagnose these infections? If I take a blood sample from you and I look at your um, your uh, total you know, CBC, I will see that you have increased eosinophils, quite a lot of eosinophils. So that would be an indicator of it, as well as um, looking at someone's stool um, in the microscope and noticing eggs or larvae or worms. Uh, there's no vaccines for any of these, and you would need regular treatment with anti-helminthic drugs in order to get rid of them. Um, these, to avoid these, get rid of your sewage appropriately, avoid using human feces as fertilizer. North Korea, I'm looking at you. Um, disinfection of the water supply as a whole, thoroughly washing and cooking vegetables and meats, and then freezing food. 
be sure that you're handling everything properly and you should be okay. All right, they have four different kinds of life cycles basically that they can go through. Um, cycle A, um, all right, we have eggs that are ingested, the larvae hatch in the intestine and enter the tissue. So you swallowed them and you go into the, the intestine and we've got stuff going into the tissue. Um, the worm will then develop into the intestine. The egg is released from the feces of the person. And then those eggs will be ingested by a new host. Okay, so that includes like Ascaris, which we'll talk about, the giant, the giant worms. Um, the next one, cycle B, worms mature in the intestine. Eggs are released with the feces. Um, larvae hatch and develop in the environment. Infection occurs through the skin by penetration of the larvae, literally burrowing through your skin to get into you. Think about that. That includes hookworms. All right, next one, cycle C. Here we have uh, adult, adult matures in the human intestine. Eggs are released in your feces. Yeah, similar story. Okay. Um, the eggs are eaten by grazing animals like cattle or pigs. Um, and then larv larval forms will insist or, you know, literally insist, E-N, C-Y-S-T, um, they uh, clump up into areas in the actual tissue of the animal that's eating them. Um, and then humans will eat the flesh and get infected and the cycle starts again. This includes um, tainia, which is a uh, uh, tapeworm. Um, then we have cycle D type of organisms. They are released in, the eggs are released in the feces. Uh, we've been talking about these freaking eggs getting released in the feces. Um, humans are infected through ingestion or direct penetration through the skin by the larval phases. So it can go either way. Um, so this is going to include opsith opsithorcus and schistosoma. If you've ever heard of schistosomiasis, that's a fluke infection. All right, next we have, the first one we have is going to be Enterobius vermicularis. This is the pinworm. These are the ones that stick out your kid's butts. Um, not kidding. So your kid gets a little um, itchy booty and you take it to the doctor or you do the tape test and they can see that there are little worms um, in the booty of your, of your kid, basically. The common, the pretty common in general. It's not fatal. It's usually asymptomatic except for the itching. Enterobius vermicularis, pinworm. Um, that's the next one, I guess. Okay. Trichurus, trichuria. This is the whipworm. So it has a life cycle A, um, high incidence in the tropics and subtropics. And there's a lot of eggs that the females will lay. Symptoms will include localized hemorrhage of the bowel, dysentery, loss of muscle tone, rectal prolapse. That's your rectum coming out where it shouldn't. Okay. Uh, tania solium. These are the tapeworms. Um, adults can get up to five meters long. Wow. Um, they are distributed worldwide, um, but concentrated in areas where humans live in clo close proximity to pigs or eat undercooked pork. Um, this is life cycle C that we were talking about. So symptoms of this, you'll see the proglottids in the stool. So that's little pieces of them that'll break off. Um, and those actually have the eggs inside of them. And then we have the uh, abdominal pain and nausea associated with infection as well. But you can have these and not have any symptoms. And, you know, of course, people used to take the proglottids as um, a pill form and try to infect themselves with tapeworms to lose weight because they would absorb nutrients in the uh, gut area. Didn't work that well. And also now you have a worm infection. Next is Ascaris lumbricoides. These are giant intestinal roundworms. Look at them. Okay, giant. <laughs> they are giant. Um, larval and adult stages um, will exist in humans. Um, the embryonic eggs will be expelled in the feces of the humans. These guys penetrate the intestinal wall. Um, they enter the lymphatic and the circulatory systems. The lymphatic and the circulatory systems, okay? After going through that um, intestinal wall. Then they're swept into the heart, eventually get into the capillaries and migrate into the lungs. Then they will migrate up the respiratory tree to the glottis where, where you're going to be swallowing them. Maybe cough a little and then you're going to swallow the worms. Good luck sleeping tonight. Good luck with that. So um, this is awful. Here's some pictures of them in the gut, um, you know, quite a lot of them built up in the gut. And then this child who unfortunately has them coming out of his mouth, he's been so horribly infected. 
it's awful. Okay, Nicator Americanus and um, Encyclostoma duodenale. <laughs> I think I did pretty good for that one. Okay, this is the hookworm. This is what I was trying to get at. So what a hookworm looks like. I'm going to show it in a second. But New World, Americanus one. Old World, Duodenale one. Okay. Um, they hatch outside the body. They penetrate through the skin. Life cycle B. Uh, they cause what is called ground itch. So there's a localized dermatitis. Um, so irritation of the skin kind of in the bottom of the feet where the worms are going to be penetrating into your skin. Um, this causes uh, pneumonia and eosinophilia, of course, eosinophilia. Um, and when the worms are transiting transiting to the lung, that's what leads to the pneumonia, okay? Uh, it leads to heavy worm burden in the intestine, can cause nausea, um, vomiting, cramps, blood diarrhea, and anemia when that happens. This is a picture of a foot that has hookworms in it. These are the threadworms, pretty similar as far as how they look and everything. Strongyloides, Stercoralis. This is, uh, right, they have the, they can complete their entire life cycle in the humans or the soil. Um, larvae penetrate the skin, invade into the lungs again, um, develop in the intestine, and then the eggs are shed in the feces. Pretty common one so far. Um, and then we will treat those, you know, there's vermox as a medication, I guess, being advertised to treat your very common strongyloides threadworm infection. Next, we have Opsithorchus sinensis and Clonorchus sinensis. These guys are Chinese liver flukes, both of them, okay? If I say Chinese liver flukes, it includes both of them in the description, okay? Um, life cycle D involved here. The larvae hatch and crawl into the bile duct. Um, they shed their uh, eggs into the intestinal tract from the bile duct. Symptoms will be slow to develop. Um, we'll have thickening of the lining of the bile duct, granuloma formation in areas of the liver, and the bile duct can become blocked, and um, that could cause a lot of pain. Fasciola hepatica. This is the liver fluke um, that is common in sheep, cattle, goats, and other animals. Outbreaks are associated with watercress. Um, have a complex life cycle. The man, mammals are the definitive host. That's where the adults are and then where the adults are gonna you know, reproduce sexually. Um, symptoms include vomiting, diarrhea, hepatomegaly, so enlargement of the actual liver, um, bile obstruction, um, if they're infle infected with a large number of flukes. Okay, now we're moving on to the ones that have muscle and neurological symptoms. Um, if you've ever heard of trichinosis, it's from eating undercooked pork. Um, basically these guys, okay. I'm gonna say what they're not gonna talk about this as much as I thought they were, but um, symptoms are gonna range from when in the early phase, diarrhea, nausea, abdominal pains, fever, and sweating. Second phase, puffiness around the eyes, um, intense muscle and joint pain, shortness of breath, eosinophilia, right? Um, prevention is through adequate storage and cooking of pork and wild meats. Starting to get the idea of why we cook pork all the way through. Next is liver disease um, caused by schistosomiasis. Schistosomiasis is caused by schistosoma masoni and schistosoma japonicum. Now, they don't live anywhere near each other and they don't look similar, but they have similar manifestations of um, disease and uh, life cycles and transmission methods, okay? So they invade through intact skin. Um, this is just showing a little bit of a life cycle of them, but I'm gonna go through talking about it instead. Signs and symptoms of schistosomiasis include itchiness in the area where the worm came in through your skin. Gross. Fills, uh, fills. fever, chills, diarrhea, and cough. Um, chronic infection, we have um, hepatomegaly, again, enlargement of the liver, liver disease itself, and then splenomegaly or splenomegaly, um, the spleen itself being enlarged. Um, bladder obstruction and blood in the urine is often a, a side effect or a side effect, they guess, a symptom of the infection as well. And this can cause a granulomatous response in the nervous system and the heart, which can be very dangerous to the nervous system, especially because um, granuloma development is, uh, you know, basically white cells that are getting ready to attack something um, and trying to wall it off and all that sort of stuff. And that can lead to a lot of inflammation in these areas where you wouldn't want it otherwise. 
pathogenesis and virulence factors of schistosomiasis. The parasite coats itself in outer surface with the uh, the parasite coats its outer surface with proteins from the bloodstream of the host, cloaking itself from the host defense system. Um, we diagnose this through identifying their eggs and urine or feces, again, using microscopes. Um, cycle of infection can't be broken as long as people are exposed to untreated sewage. So you want to make sure, you know, you start treating your sewage well and not getting exposed through, you know, fecal route. And then um, praziquantel is the drug that we would use to treat schistosomiasis. All right. So here are all the diseases that we are, you know, teaching you about in your GI tract. All right, there's your GI sicknesses. Um, good little figures in these and a lot larger online when we look at the um, book online. So GI tract defenses like mucus, galt, um, the gut associated lymphatic tissue, peristalsis, moving things through, the pH being low in the gut and the higher pH of the bile, and then um, enzymes to break things down as well. Um, there's a lot of normal microbes in the inhab. Um, there's a lot of sorry. There's a lot of microbes that inhabit our gut just normally, um, and then you know we went through all these diseases that can happen either if that biome gets thrown off or they can just supersede the biome altogether. I mean, the stadium seats, the worm ain't worrying about no stadium seats, right? So that's the issue with that. Okay, so that's that for chapter twenty two. <laughs> Um, I look forward to seeing you guys in chapter 23 and then, you know, kicking you out. So um, I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.